Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program. Turning Germans Against Jews, Photographic Denunciation in Pre-War Nazi Germany. My name is Donna Oser. I chair adult education at Har Shalom Congregation in Potomac, Maryland, and I'm delighted that Har Shalom enjoys such a strong partnership with the Haberman Institute for Jewish Studies and that both organizations are sponsoring this event. My thanks to Rabbi Adam Raskin, Rabbi Rachel Simmons, Hazan Henri Oser Bass, and the administrators of both Har Shalom and Haberman for their efforts to create this program and to make it the success I'm sure it will be. Thank you all again for your interest and participation tonight. A bit of housekeeping, please use the Q&A option to enter your questions for the Q&A session at the end of Dr. Koresti's talk. And now here's Matt Silverman from the Haberman Institution to complete the introductions. Thank you, Donna, and thank you, and thank you all for joining us. As Donna said, I'm Matthew Silverman, and it is my pleasure to also welcome you to this lecture. First, I would like to thank the Wagner Bronzberg Family Foundation for sponsoring this program as part of our ongoing series on German Jewish heritage. We truly appreciate your family support. And as um, Donna said, we also thank Congregation Har Shalom for their support and making this program and bringing it to all of you today. Before introducing our speaker, I would like to highlight a new program that was just finalized yesterday. Tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time, we invite you to join us as we hear from Israeli volunteers at a small Jewish nonprofit who are helping to aid those in need in Israel. It is a transformative story during these difficult times that illuminates the personal connections, hope, and real needs of the community. A true moment of our Torah learning leading to action. I hope that you can join us. We're gonna put a registration link in the chat now, which you can uh, use at any time this evening. So now on to this evening, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Julie Kuretsis, postdoctoral fellow at American University and at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies. Dr. Kuretsis is a historian of modern Germany who specializes in photography during the Third Reich and the Holocaust. She received her doctorate with distinction in history from Boston University and is the recipient of fellowships and grants from the German Historical Institute, the Leo Beck Institute, the American Academy for Jewish Research, and the Central European Historical History Society. She is currently finishing a book manuscript on photography in Nazi Germany and is working on a critical biography of Heinrich Hoffmann Adolf Hitler's personal photographer. With that, Dr. Kretzis, thank you for joining us. We look forward to learning from you this evening and the screen is now yours. Welcome. Wonderful. Thank you for that kind introduction, Matthew. And welcome everyone. Thank you all for being here tonight. So I will just really quickly share my screen with you all. and we'll get going. I want to begin by sharing two accounts of a strange practice that was beginning to take hold in Nazi Germany in early 1933. One of them comes from Berlin. On the morning of April 1st, Hannelore Schuttgen, who was only 10 years old at the time, went grocery shopping with her mother. At the entrance to the local markets, the pair encountered men blocking the entrance. These men were dressed in the uniform of the SA, or Sturmabteilung, at the time the Nazi party's main paramilitary force. Hannah Laura's mother told her that they would shop there anyway, so they pushed past the men and entered. After finishing their shopping, on their way out, two of the SA men took photographs of them, Hanalora's mother thought nothing of it until that evening when she received a telephone call from her husband's boss at the school where he worked. He told her that he had just returned from the movies 
and that pictures of her had been displayed before the film alongside captions that declared, quote, this lady no shows no shame. She still buys her provisions in Jewish run stores, end quote. Her husband's boss warned her that, quote, the wife of a German educator does not buy in Jewish shops, end quote. From then on, and at her mother's request, young Hannah Laura did the shopping by herself. On the same morning, about 340 miles away in Frankfurt, Margaret Cohn experienced a similar incident. She went to a Jewish-owned department store and was also photographed exiting the building as a crowd outside shouted at her for shopping there. She answered back, quote, why shouldn't I? I'm Jewish too, end quote. In the end, several sympathetic men had to clear a path for her to escape her harassers. And the next day, the pictures of her were displayed in a nearby town square. Both of these incidents raise a number of questions. The first set of questions pertain to the practice they describe. Why were SA men photographing shoppers and publicly displaying the pictures? What did they hope to achieve in this? Were they doing so on their own initiative or on the orders of their superiors? How effective was this practice? How widespread? And did it continue after 1933? The next set of questions deal with the particular cases of Hannah Laura and Margaret. Were they exceptional? What about the practice persuaded Hannah Laura's mother to alter her behavior? And what compelled Margaret to so courageously declare that she was Jewish at a time when doing so would have exposed her to potentially severe consequences? After many months spent examining archival sources at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, I found that these were far from isolated cases. They very much embodied the broader phenomenon of what I call photographic denunciation, in which Nazi functionaries took and displayed pictures of German shopping at Jewish-owned businesses. I learned that the Nazis used the practice to terrorize Jews, as well as bully non-Jewish Germans, into severing ties with Jewish friends and neighbors. I also learned that photographic denunciation successfully turned many non-Jewish Germans against Jews, and that in doing so, it played a key role in creating the conditions that would ultimately make it possible for the Nazi regime to perpetrate the Holocaust. One of the conditions that made the Holocaust possible was the isolation of Jews from public life. The practice of photographic denunciation helped the Nazis carry out the dispossession of German Jews in their first five years of power. The anti-Semitic legislation that began to take effect in 1933 deprived Jews of their citizenship, their jobs, and property to hasten their social isolation, impoverishment, and until 1941, their departure from Germany. This could not have happened as quickly as it did without the willingness of former customers and colleagues to stop shopping at Jewish-owned businesses, for their choices directly helped to facilitate their ruin. The second condition, then, was the active compliance or passive indifference of non-Jewish Germans towards what was happening to their Jewish neighbors, friends, and colleagues. Photographic denunciation also helped the Nazis pressure non-Jewish Germans into changing their behavior in line with the regime's anti-Semitism. Many Germans, of course, needed no persuading. There were already more than enough of them who were eager to join Nazi organizations, betray the Jews they knew, and enact Nazi ideas and policies in their own ways. But other Germans were slower to adopt the Nazi party line and Nazi officials, as well as fellow civilians, tirelessly shamed and bullied them until they did. So bearing these conditions in mind, 
what was the practice of photographic denunciation itself, and how did it begin and evolve over time? The April 1st, 1933 blockade of Jewish-owned businesses and firms gave the Nazis their first public opportunity after Hitler came to power to introduce photographic denunciation. During the blockade, Nazi stormtroopers beat and murdered Jews, defaced Jewish-owned property, and posted anti-Semitic signs to businesses, residences, and offices. SA men also stood menacingly near the entrances and taunted those who ignored them and went inside anyway. Many of those SA men had cameras with them and took pictures of shoppers as they left the premises. Nazi agents even labeled some businesses with posters that read, Jewish business, whoever shops here will be photographed. Occasionally, SA men also threatened customers with the prospect of recording them on film as well. But the reproducibility and accessibility of still photographs made it the preferred format for the practice. Essay photographers then typically published the images they made in Der Sturmer, the grotesque anti-Semitic tabloid published by Julius Streicher that had been peddling anti-Semitic caricatures, conspiracy theories, and smear campaigns against local Jews in German economic, cultural, and political life since it first emerged in 1923. The photographs of customers leaving Jewish-owned stores typically appeared in a column called They Bought from Jews, which featured snapshots of people shopping in cities or towns throughout Germany. The pictures were also posted in Der Sturmer's display boxes, which held the latest complete issues of the publication to ensure that the images would be visible even to those who did not subscribe to it. One of those boxes can be seen in the photograph here. This picture, made in 1935 by an unknown photographer, shows a couple pausing to read the latest issue of Der Sturmer. The woman on the right is pushing a pram with a child inside. Emblazoned around the display case that the couple looks at are some of the newspaper's main anti-Semitic slogans, including the Jews are our misfortune, and whoever buys from Jews is a traitor to the people. In addition to these displays, it was also common for Nazi agents to project the pictures before films at cinemas or post them to bulletin boards and other public spaces in town squares and other common areas. The threat of public identification through photographs prompted many Germans even those who had initially refused to comply with Nazi orders to alter their behavior towards Jews. To be caught on camera shopping at a Jewish-owned business was to provide visual evidence for civilians and state authorities alike of having broken the rules of membership in the Volksgemeinschaft or the Nazi vision of a racially exclusive national community. Publicly displayed photographs opened violators to potential retaliation and ostracism, not just from those who already knew them, but from total strangers as well. Risks that the very act of being photographed facilitated too. These threats could be very effective. A former Hitler Youth member, for instance, recalled that during the April blockade, he and his family had ignored the signs placed out front warning shoppers not to buy from Jews. But he also recalled that if they knew or had, or had heard that SA men with cameras would be there, then, quote, nobody would shop at Jewish stores, end quote. Often, the threat of being photographed alone was enough to keep people away. And while the practice aspired to expose both non-Jewish men and women, it disproportionately singled out women, for they were more likely to do the shopping. As the case of young Hannah Laura indicates, Nazi agents frequently used photographs of women customers 
to threaten them with the loss of their husband's jobs if they continued shopping there. Photographic denunciation was intended to primarily target non-Jewish Germans, but the Nazis' reliance on appearances to distinguish non-Jewish from Jewish Germans ensured that SA men, as well as civilians, regularly mistook Jews for non-Jewish Germans. This is why Margaret Cohn, for example, so bravely invoked her Jewishness to the crowd in Frankfurt, Knowing that non-Jewish Germans were the target of the practice, she was trying to protect herself from further attacks. But it is also why the crowd was so unresponsive to her declaration. Perhaps they didn't believe her, but they also relished the opportunity presented by the confusion to so fear and terrorize Jews even more. She would later write that on that day of the April 1st blockade, she had made what she sarcastically referred to as her, quote, debut as an Aryan, end quote. In another similarly courageous display witnessed by an observer, a woman scolded the essay man who photographed her. She left a Jewish-owned butcher shop for having wasted his film on her because she was, in fact, Jewish. Photographic denunciation continued well after 1933. It remained a fixture for local Nazis as they instigated unofficial anti-Semitic blockades throughout the 1930s. These anti-Semitic outbursts spiked during the summer of 1935. Historians have attributed the heightened anti-Semitic atmosphere that year to the dissatisfaction among Nazi party members and district leaders with the progress made by the state in promulgating official legislation that would more radically address what they refer to as the Jewish question. The September 1935 Nuremberg race laws would ultimately satisfy these demands. Until then, however, Nazi enthusiasts took matters into their own hands, which is why photographic denunciation cases also spiked that summer. The archives of Der Sturmer noticeably expand in cases of photographic denunciation in the year 1935. In a May 1935 issue, for example, denouncers photograph two nuns entering and exiting a Jewish-owned department store in Darmstadt. The most radical ideologues in the Nazi party had long portrayed Christianity itself as a fight against Jews and attacked those in the Catholic and Protestant religious community who expressed opinions or behaved in ways that challenged this. Clearly targeted because both women wore their habits while shopping, the captions relied on a centuries old anti-Semitic trope when it accused the two sisters of buying, quote, from the descendants of the Christ killers, end quote. A subsequent issue, of Der Sturmer from June 1935, printed a series of three photographs from Nordhausen, Germany, that condemned a man and two women for shopping at Jewish-owned businesses. The woman in the photograph on the far right is reprimanded in the captions for having brought her child there. The woman in the middle photograph is even marked with an X to more clearly identify her as the offender. And in what can only be assumed as an invitation to track down her husband and attack them both for shopping at Jewish-owned businesses, the caption also discloses that, quote, her husband works at the local theater, end quote. Unlike the two pictures of the nuns in the previous example, the pictures here all show shoppers leaving Jewish-owned stores for that was the most effective way for the photographers to show their faces and therefore identify who they were. In another photograph from June 29th, 1935, denouncers photographed a woman leaving a Jewish owned business with her bicycle. The blurriness of the image, as well as the sense of movement in the upper left-hand corner gives the impression that the photographer 
made this picture very quickly. The Berlin Central Association of German Citizens of Jewish Faith expressed particular alarm about the rise in photographic denunciation cases. Founded in 1893 in Berlin to combat rising anti-Semitism in Germany, the association operated dozens of local branches nationwide that, after 1928, distributed anti-Nazi materials and increasingly reported on Nazi anti-Semitic activities. The association had been reporting on photographic denunciation since 1933. In July 1935, association representatives noted in official reports and documents how successful the practice had become in identifying Jews in local communities and turning non-Jewish Germans against them. The German Social Democratic Party, now operating in exile from Prague, also expressed alarm about the rising tide of photographic denunciation reports. In the Saxon city of Emden, for example, the party noted in August 1935 how, quote, in front of the single large Jewish department store, six SA men appeared selling copies of Der Sturmer. At least one of them carried a camera to take pictures of people entering the store, end quote. Their reports also revealed that members of the SS now joined SA men in these actions, a consequence of Hitler's summer 1934 purge of the SA, an elevation of Heinrich Himmler and his SS force as the Nazi regime's main paramilitary unit. Their reports, as well as the reports of the Berlin Central Association of German Citizens of Jewish Faith, also revealed that the practice became so widespread by 1935 that individuals other than SS and SA men began to adopt it as well. Popular participation in photographic denunciation had already begun during the April 1933 blockade, but reached new heights in the summer of 1935. Further accounts from that year indicate that members of the Hitler Youth as well as the National Socialist Women's League and German civilians unaffiliated with Nazi organizations took it upon themselves to photograph shoppers. It was a sign of how seriously many Germans took their membership in the Volksgemeinschaft. It was also a sign that the Nazis' plans for popular photography were beginning to take hold. The introduction of small frame cameras, such as the Leica, already made photography more accessible than ever to the public. But beginning in 1933, Nazi authorities took this one step further when they promoted photography as an exclusive practice open only to non-Jewish Germans. Nazi officials and organizations offered non-Jewish Germans photography materials and classes at a discounted rate in partnership with film and camera retailers. They prohibited Jews from practicing professional and amateur photography, stole their studios and equipment, and redistributed these to non-Jewish Germans. The fact that some German civilians now use their cameras to enact Nazi policies then testified precisely to this official vision of what popular photography was for. But photographic denunciation also continued and expanded in the mid 1930s because a unanimous consensus had not yet formed among Germans toward Jews. This lack of agreement compelled some to engage in acts of defiance when people confronted them with cameras. As the German Social Democrats noted in the summer of 1935, the practice had decisively deterred some, but, quote, others laugh and still go in, end quote. One such case, as the SPD observed in August 1935, involved Adolf Schutz, an innkeeper from Ludwigshafen. 
He had gone shopping in the Jewish owned department store across the street from his apartment. After he left the store, a crowd surrounded him. An SA man with a camera was among them. And we, when he approached him, Schutz defiantly told him, you can take a picture of me, end quote. The crowd swiftly attacked him, resulting in five calls to the police and Schutz's arrest and eventual imprisonment. Photographic denunciation continued into 1937. One December 1937 photograph from the Der Sturmer archive, for example, shows a man standing outside a Jewish-owned shoe shop, the captions condemning him for having done his Christmas shopping there. A young boy and another man stand outside the shop as well, their backs turned to the photographer. Unlike the previous photographs that I have shown, this man makes no eye contact with the camera, as if he is either unaware of its presence, uninterested in it, or even unintimidated by it. At around the same time, the practice of photographic denunciation expanded to target Germans engaged in activities other than shopping. Denouncers also began to monitor those who attended funerals and birthday parties honoring Jews, for example. In October 1937, one local mayor observed that attendees at the funeral of a local Jewish merchant were photographed and that it, quote, cannot be ruled out that the photos are to be published in Der Stürmer, end quote. And when Gerta Pfeffer, who was Jewish, celebrated her birthday with colleagues from the factory where she worked, some of those in attendance were Nazi party members. She remembered that the next day, the local Nazi party district leader threatened to publish the photos that someone had taken at the party in Der Sturmer. She became, as she put it, more frightened than ever. Despite this extension of photographic denunciation to other activities, shopping remained its primary focus. It is for that reason that only at the end of 1938 would photographic denunciation subside in Germany. The violence and destruction of the nationwide November Kristallnacht pogroms, coupled with the forced closure of all remaining Jewish businesses by decree on November 12th, sealed the removal of German Jews from public and economic life. Photography was no longer needed to pressure Germans to stop shopping at Jewish-owned businesses, for there were very few of those businesses left. But photographic denunciation continued beyond Germany's borders. Germans living in Shanghai, China, for instance, became subject to it. According to Nazi records, a substantial number of non-Jewish German nationals lived in Shanghai. Moreover, between 1933 and 1938, the city had become a popular haven for German, Austrian, and Czech Jews who had fled Nazi persecution. Nazi officials initiated anti-Semitic blockades in Shanghai in the fall of 1941. In a November 8th memo ordering the blockade of 270 businesses in Shanghai that the Nazis condemned as either Jewish or Soviet, the Shanghai Nazis also declared that, quote, anyone violating the order to boycott Jewish shops would be photographed and a report of his action together with the picture would be sent to Berlin and placed in a file for future consideration, end quote. The memo did not specify whether the picture would be published in Der Sturmer or some other Nazi pub publication. Nor did it say if the corresponding file would pass to the Gestapo or the Nazi foreign organization, the main agency tasked with educating all Germans living abroad in accordance with Nazi ideology. Perhaps that ambiguity was precisely the point. 
The uncertainty would only increase apprehension and fear about where the pictures would appear and who would see them. Even in late 1941, Nazi party officials still relied on photographic denunciation to coerce non-Jewish Germans into abandoning their Jewish neighbors. And like the war and genocide that were already well underway by November 1941, that project knew few geographical limits. The fact that the Nazi officials, functionaries, and civilian enthusiasts used photography so prominently to achieve this project, though, reveals the broader significance of photography in the dictatorship's reconfiguration of German society and systematic persecution of Jews. We tend to associate photography from the era of Nazi persecution with the crude anti-Semitic images that Nazi propagandists designed and circulated to convince Germans that Jews were their enemies. But photography was also a tool of social control. Photography provided Nazi officials and civilians alike with a way to actively participate in forging a new consensus about who belonged in German society. And in the example of photographic denunciation, we see how this participation through photography helped turn non-Jewish Germans against Jews and destroy what remained of the bonds between them. That too was the power of photography in paving the way for the Holocaust. Thank you very much. Thank, th <clears throat> thank you uh, for such a nuanced and interesting presentation. I, much of this was was new to me. I wasn't aware of the role that photo you know photography played in in Germany prior to the Holocaust and even as far as Shanghai. So that's it's, you know very interesting and. So thank you. And for those of you with questions, now is the time to, to begin asking them. Um, I see there's there's a couple that have come in, but um, we have uh, plenty of time for questions. And I was just wondering to, to get us started, I wonder if there are stories of Germans who who still shopped at you. You mentioned the one, you know, the one uh, person who wasn't look, making eye contact with the camera. Well, uh, were there stories of of Germans who still went to the, you know, I don't know if they stood up or whatever, still went to the, the Jewish um, shops or was it pretty quickly that they, everybody stopped going and. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and, and an important one. Um, I found as in the case of, of that innkeeper, um, Adolf Schutz, that there were Germans who uh, continued to refuse to comply with Nazi policies. Uh, and he was certainly not alone in that. But the most interesting thing, I think, about this type of denunciation is the extent to which it did persuade even those Germans who did not comply with just the, the presence of SA men standing near the entrances to change their behavior towards Jews. Uh, photographic denunciation did not single-handedly persuade everybody to change their behavior, but it did slowly start to chip away at the remaining fabric uh, that made it easier then uh, for those, those anti-Semitic policies and legislation to take hold. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's some questions now in if you yes. want. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a, a great question here uh, on why I call the boycott a blockade. Um, and, and that's a great question. So the reason why I do that is to reflect recent scholarship on the economic uh, persecution of German Jews uh, to refrain from using Nazi terminology when it comes to describing what happened the Nazis used the word boycott to describe what they were doing on April 1st. Uh, and the problem with the term boycott is not just that it's borrowed from Nazi language. It also means very specific things about why a person would refuse to shop at a particular place. It typically means uh, that the refusal to shop there is done for moral or ethical concerns. 
Uh, and the fact that the Nazis used the term was meant to disguise the fact that this was just a full on assault on Jewish economic life. Uh, so the reason why I use the term blockade is to more accurately describe uh, what was really happening without replicating the, the euphemisms used by the Nazis. There's also some interesting questions on uh, the, the role of photography today in public shaming. And um, yes, I absolutely still see cases of this in the world today, certainly in very different contexts, uh, but it is, uh, as is photography in general, a very powerful tool of social control and social pressure. And I do see uh, similar cases of it being used all over the world. Uh, there's another question here about when Jewish owned stores and businesses uh, started to go out of business or when they were taken over by non-Jews. Uh, and that's a that's an interesting and, and also very important question. The process of what historians of, of economic discrimination during the period call dispossession started happening in 1933 and continued really with particular enthusiasm throughout the 1930s, um, and especially in the years of 1938 to 1939. Um, it varied by the, the particular industry that that store was a part of. If the Nazis felt that a particular company or business was particularly valuable to Germany, they would more quickly take it over. Uh, and if the, the particular business was seen as not as central, not as critical uh, to Germany's national reputation, particularly the press, then it might take a little bit more time uh, for the Nazis to take it over. In my own research, I know the photographic industry best. So often the cases I've encountered uh, take place from roughly the 19. 1935 to 1939 period with that particular industry. And in some cases, the ones I've come across typically involve uh, professionals working in photography, Jewish men and women, um, being forced out so that former workers, former interns who were not Jewish uh, could simply take over those positions. Um, just to give you one specific example of how this played out, uh, the portrait photographer Suze Bick, who ran a very prolific studio in Berlin throughout the 1920s and 30s, uh, in 1938 was forced to hand over the business, uh, which was a very successful, very well-known, prestigious portrait studio, to a former intern uh, who was able to purchase the studio for only 5,000 marks, uh, even though the, the value of the studio was estimated at around 60,000 marks. So that number, of course, is woefully below its true value. And she was able to do so by receiving a loan from the German labor front. So the, the Nazi regime more or less floated her the money so that she could take over uh, Susan Bick's studio. So that's just one example. But there are many, many uh, really interesting pieces of, of history writing about this field. And I'd be happy uh, to provide recommendations if, if you would like that. Um, let's see. Other questions about, uh, I see a question here about photographic techniques to discourage Jews from public parks or other places. Um, or when or when Jews were associating with non-Jews in other spheres? That's a great question. Um, I have not seen much that refers to these kinds of techniques uh, when it comes to public parks and, and spaces. Probably the most comparable example though, comes from a photography that was meant to shame 
uh, people in, in what the Nazis referred to as mixed marriages, uh, race defilement cases between Jews and non-Jewish Germans. So individuals that, that the Nazis found guilty of that, especially when uh, the Nuremberg laws made that uh, a criminal offense in 1935, there is a lot of photography uh, that was produced during that period to shame those individuals who were accused of that. So that's probably um, the most similar case in terms of photographic techniques that I've seen so far. Yes, there's a, a comment here about Kristallnacht and that after the destruction, uh, the, the Nazis uh, made the Jewish community pay for the destruction. Uh, and yes, that is, um, that is absolutely one of the most horrifying aspects of this history uh, and particular one of the most horrifying aspects of uh, Kristallnacht is that after all the destruction and violence and terror that the Nazis themselves created, that they then forced uh, the Jews to pay for the damages. Um, and this is, I think, a, a part of a broader kind of emphasis on plunder, enrichment, and profit uh, that certainly drove many Nazi officials and authorities but also civilians as well, not just in this period of, of persecution from 1933 to 1938, uh, but also during the period of concentration and annihilation after 1939 as well. Oh, this is a, a great, a great question. Were there other publications other than Der Sturmer that showed these pictures? Um, yeah, that's a that's an intriguing point. I've seen some references. Uh, to the pictures showing up in more local regional newspapers, but I have not yet found examples in other kinds of newspapers themselves. It does seem to have been a kind of priority for Der Sturmer, uh, in part because I think that is where many of the photographers belonging to the SA would have gone to first. Uh, but it's certainly possible that uh, there are many other newspapers waiting for me to, to find that also contain similar types of photography as well. Uh, this is a, a great question from Stephen um, on where, uh, oh, where, were rather Jewish photographers prevented from, from getting supplies. Yes, absolutely. Um, in the course of my research, I found that uh, photography was something that uh, was uh, prohibited for, for German Jews at this period, not just professionally, but on an amateur level. And often the way that that worked uh, was in, in the shops themselves. People who ran photography supply stores would refuse to, to sell uh, items and equipment to Jews. Uh, sometimes as well during particular outbursts on Kristallnacht, for example, there are a number of testimonies describing uh, Hitler Youth and SA men bursting into professional studios and, and stealing all the equipment. Uh, and of course, preventing them from practicing photography, preventing them from uh, accessing more supplies. And so absolutely, it was a, a sort of broad scale prohibition on, on allowing German Jews to practice uh, this pastime that the Nazis saw as exclusive only to non-Jewish Germans. Oh, that's an interesting question. Were there people who used makeup or, uh, you know, other disguises as well to obscure their identity? And, and if so, how well did this work? Uh, that is something that I have not come across uh, in my own research, but it's an interesting question. And 
uh, it reminds me of the, the broader literature on the, the kinds of strategies that uh, Jewish and non-Jewish Germans used to navigate Nazi persecution policies during this period. Uh, so in my own research and in the, the specific case of photographic denunciation, I have not seen evidence of that, but that certainly doesn't mean that it's not out there uh, waiting to be discovered. Another uh, interesting question of um, the prohibition on, on Jews practicing photography and, and whether that was carried out in other countries uh, like Austria and uh, the Netherlands. In my research, I have I've found that, that yes, prohibiting Jews from owning cameras and accessing film and, and other equipment um, was certainly something that the Nazis uh, kind of disseminated as they conquered the, the European continent. So one thing that I've found uh, is that the Nazis kind of forcibly took over some photography business in Nazi-occupied Europe, just as they had in Germany. And for those arriving in ghettos and concentration camps, uh, cameras and loose photographs and albums were among the first things that were confiscated from them. So uh, absolutely, this ban was not limited to Germany uh, proper. It certainly extended beyond German borders. Uh, and it sort of followed the logic and chronology of World War II when it ultimately broke out. The um, earlier question that I, I think I didn't see at the time, but I'm seeing now, uh, is the the sort of presence of Nazis in Shanghai. Um, and considering the fact that many Jews did find safety there, whether the Nazis had any particular power. Uh, this is something that I'm still looking into in regards to this subject. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting scholarship from the past decade or so on uh, Shanghai, not just as a space for Jewish emigration and fleeing Nazi persecution in Europe, uh, but also the sort of uh, kind of transnational borders of Nazi power as well. So my sense um, in this particular episode that I cite uh, is that there was this sort of attempt at creating the same circumstances in, in order for photographic denunciation to, to flourish, but it seems to have been a very different and, and, and very uh, kind of uh, piecemeal process compared to the case of, of Germany proper in the 30s. So it's certainly something that I'm still looking into, um, but it's also something that more and more historians are writing about because of the sort of opening of archives and a new documentation. I'll, um, I'll pop in with, with the question while we, we see if more come in. Um, and hopefully I was sidetracked with logistics a moment ago, so hopefully didn't, you didn't answer it. But um, as you're doing your research, I wonder how many, how many photographs ex exist and like what what are you trying to uncover next and as sort of um, as, as your research unfolds? Mm. Um, so my my book manuscript that I'm finishing up now uh, more broadly tries to understand photography in Nazi Germany as this sort of social pastime uh, and tries to look at it as a way of uh, encouraging Germans to participate in building this Volksgemeinschaft, uh, this racially exclusive uh, Nazi community. So the book traces the, the meaning of photography towards that project from the very early 1930s uh, and talks about how it drove the, the Nazi dispossession of Jewish photographers towards that end. Uh, and also examines how that configuration of photography as a pastime that was meant to, to reaffirm the bonds of the Volksgemeinschaft also 
takes form in World War One or sorry, World War Two era of photography among German soldiers. So rather than seeing the pictures of, of atrocities and racism and anti-Semitism that uh, we tend to rightfully and understandably expect, uh, I've seen many more cases of far more banal images of uh, comradeship and family and, and friends and leisure. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because that official Nazi configuration of photography prioritized using photography to, to showcase those ties to the members of the Volksgemeinschaft. So uh, that is the, the first book project that I'm uh, wrapping up. And I'm working currently on this biography of, of Adolf Hitler's uh, personal photographer, Heinrich Hoffmann, for a couple of different reasons. The main reason, I think, is to encourage people to see Hoffmann as not just a photographer. And, and we're very familiar with his images of Hitler. Uh, almost everybody, I think, in, in this uh, digital space here, I'm sure, is familiar with Hoffman's images of Hitler. But he is far less familiar as a very particular type of Nazi personality. And the book argues that Hoffman uh, is a valuable character to study, not just for, for his photography and for his contributions to the rise of the Nazi party and Hitler, but also in understanding what type of person is attracted to the fascism of the 1920s. Uh, and so the book traces Hoffman's life and career uh, and points out that, that his anti-Semitism and his opportunism were kind of hallmarks of this type of Nazi personality. Thank you. It looks like there's at least uh, one new question at the by uh, Richard Gorman, which you, you may or may not be familiar with. Hmm. Oh yes, I I think I do know. Um, I do know this photograph. Um, so this particular photograph. Um, I think is some, it's something I know, but I, I don't actually know the circumstances around the creation of it. So that's something that I would have to, have to look more into in the future, but it's very, uh, useful to make a note of that. So I can, I can do that. Um, one of the, the Goebbels photographs that, that I think of as being, uh, the most iconic are the is that that photograph of Goebbels sitting in the chair that was taken by Alfred Eisenstadt, I believe, um, who's a, a Jewish photographer, and Goebbels is kind of scowling at him while he's being photographed, uh, and and that image is is often used to sort of um, kind of mock Goebbels and and kind of uh, kind of poke fun at him, but then also to to sort of indicate this tension between this, this powerful Nazi propagandist uh, who is actually at the, the sort of creative artistic mercy of someone that he is uh, so intent on destroying through uh, the Nazi regime. So that is the one I'm more familiar with. Um, so I'll have to, I'll definitely have to look into the Philippe Halsman photograph. Uh, thank you for that. Um, there, uh, the this, this question about Lenny, Riefenstahl, um, yes, that's a that's an interesting question. My sense is that uh, she did do some still photography on the side, but that she prioritized uh, making movies and and filmmaking. Um, I have thought about the relationship between uh, Riefenstahl and Hoffman quite a bit to to kind of. Uh, get a sense of whether or not he participated in the the making of those movies. And I haven't seen much evidence to suggest that he did um, or that there was a particular photographer involved uh, in making uh, her films. And, and Triumph of the Will um, is, is certainly one example of that. So my sense is, is that no, 
um, there were not many, uh, at least from what I can what I can tell photographers involved in the making of that film. And part of the reason for that, and one of the things that has drawn me to this project to begin with is the power dynamics creatively of these sort of epicenters of, of power revolving around uh, Goebbels and, and Hitler. Uh, it was very competitive. The, the sort of Ian Kershaw working towards the Fuhrer principle was very much uh, at play here, um, and and Hoffman and and Riefenstahl too were uh, interested in in kind of outdoing other artists and other creatives to gain the most access to Hitler, to gain the most favor. So they would not necessarily have wanted to collaborate with other artists and and other photographers or filmmakers in doing this. Um, and the other reason for it too was that the the nazis uh hitler especially but but goebbels too were very particular about the kinds of images that that they wanted to show uh about hitler and about the nazi movement so they wanted that control as much as possible over those those kinds of images Um, there's a, a question on whether I'm myself a photographer. Um, yes, I do. I do practice um, portrait photography on the side. Um, and so, yes, that's something that I have taken up as as sort of a hobby. Uh, but the other reason why I, I continue to practice it is because I am so interested in studying the history of photography and, and knowing how cameras work and what it's like to take pictures and, and what drives uh, picture making and, and picture taking is really helpful at imagining how historical actors uh, did the same things. So, so yes, I am a photographer as well. Um, one question about the echoes of of Nazi Germany now. Um, there are, you know, there are certainly very troubling um, concerns that I have about the rise of anti-Semitism, uh, which seems now to be particularly strong. And as a historian of of Nazi Germany, um, I do absolutely see some troubling similarities between the, the period that I'm studying and our current moment. And of course, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, not just in the US, but, but in the world today is, is absolutely a powerful presence and very much on the rise. Uh, and of course, absolutely a, a very concerning and alarming development. Oh, an interesting question about um, how the pictures were, would have been sent by SA photographers to Der Sturmer and then distributed to theaters. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So after SA photographers took the pictures, they would then uh, develop them probably in a, a sort of uh, trusted Nazi photography studio or in a, a particular studio that, that they had e the easiest access to. Der Sturmer uh, certainly also would have had access to, to this kind of studio. Um, so they would develop them there and then typically uh, 
you know, send the the physical images themselves to particular theaters uh, and and other outlets for them to include in in the the news reels or or film reels for the evening, and the the process of of sort of uh, placing or applying that image to to the film the film reel would have been. Uh, also a a dark room process as well. So uh, a very complicated and very laborious and and intense process to make that happen, which also reflects as well the sort of determination and value that the people involved in that process would have placed on making these pictures not only uh, accessible to the public, but almost immediately viewable as well. Um, a question about whether the Nazis tried to ban uh, particular photographs um, or or collect and and destroy particular types of photographs. Uh, and the I think the question um, is referring to the the pre nineteen thirty three. Period. I'd be curious to to know what the the person who asked this question is specifically referring to when when they say uh, doing all sorts of things. But on the broader topic of what types of photographs were banned uh, or destroyed, that uh, for for that we have to look to the immediate period of of World War II and the Holocaust. The Nazis actually did. Uh, beginning in in 1941 and 1942, prohibit atrocity photos from being made or circulated, uh, and that ban applied to not only Wehrmacht soldiers but but SS men as well who were mobilized um, in combat units. So they did place a ban on those kinds of pictures, as well as particular pictures that disclosed certain military intelligence information um, and other things that could give away military strategy. Before the war, I've seen some discussion among Nazi officials about photographing Hitler without his permission. Hitler was very protective of his own image, which is why he only really ever allowed Heinrich Hoffmann to take pictures of him. Um, And so there was concern during the 30s about particular pictures that that were taken of Hitler. Uh, Whether those were destroyed or collected and gathered is unclear, probably not, given the priorities that the Nazis had uh, at the time. But as far as actual tangible bans on certain kinds of pictures, the the ban that I'm most familiar with uh, is the ban on, on atrocity photos during the war. Well, it's a very good question. Was anyone ever punished after appearing in in one of these photos? And I'm uh, assuming that we're talking about the photographic denunciation images and not uh, the uh, sort of perpetrator atrocity images during the war. Um, For the people who appeared uh, in print in the photographs themselves for photographic denunciation, it depended on who the person was. Often the the kind of punishment would be ostracism and and social pressure and bullying and harassment. Uh, If though the person had some sort of record, if they made uh, some kind of disturbance as again, uh, in that case of, of the innkeeper Adolf Schutz, Uh, then they might be arrested uh, or detained for some period of time. But the the most common punishment was was social punishment. 
uh, and of course the the sort of threats to livelihood that that also could ensue um the threat to to women's husbands um, that that uh, threatened to take away their jobs, uh, and sometimes that did uh, in fact happen, but for the most part, the the threat was really um, most proximate in terms of of belonging to the social community and and the kind of pressures and uh, kind of shaming that would result from that. Uh, this question is more about um, the sort of archival uh, sources that that I've used. And yes, I do mean the, the Holocaust Museum in downtown Washington. Um, and there, I mostly used the records of the, the Association for, for German Citizens of Jewish Faith, uh, which were very helpful in not just conveying uh, the extent to which people were talking about this and and becoming very concerned and anxious uh, about the the prevalence of this of this behavior and this practice, but also revealed the kinds of strategies that that Jewish Germans were using to to protect themselves and and try to uh, fight against this practice and to try to intervene and, and alleviate the situation. Um, other than those kinds of um, archival records, those microfilm records. I also used uh, a number of published sources. Um, the documents of the Social Democratic Party in exile from Germany um, are actually published into a, a series called the SOPOD Reports. And those are, are books. They're, they're printed as books. They're published. And they are in German, most of them. Um, there are, I think, one or two that are translated in English, but the complete set is in is in German. So I would imagine that a lot of that material is is very much in Germany today. Um, the archive of Der Stürmer is also headquartered in Germany in the the Nuremberg city archives, and they have the photographs that I that I showed today, they have many more photographs that I was not able to show for copyright reasons. Um, and those archives uh, as well also contain copies of the actual newspaper where you can see the particular column uh, in the newspaper where those pictures appeared and were published. Uh, and so there's absolutely a sort of um, kind of uh, border crossing uh, presence and and weight to the availability of sources that that document this. Certainly in Germany, um, also in the United States, and and surely in many other locations too. Um, yeah, this this question on um, sort of the power of photography in the present and its role in um, contemporary culture and society. And yes, this is this is absolutely uh, one of the the observations that has driven my work. Um, photography still, of course, plays a very important role in. Uh, all sorts of, of different uh, realms today, especially uh, like the one I, I referred to earlier, the, the role of photography in public shaming in various ways. Um, but it's also precisely because photography is so prevalent and familiar to us that I think um, there's often a, a sort of irresistible urge to not think about it so seriously. It's just sort of think of it as an illustration and to move on rather than really intently and, and critically analyzing it. And it's precisely because um, it is so prevalent today that I that I try to do that in my research. 
from the perspective of a period where the sort of photography boom started to, to come to fruition. Uh, so that's absolutely a, a connection that I make in my research. Oh, uh, a question on uh, the photographer August uh, Xander. Yes, absolutely. Um, Xander does come up in my research, um, not necessarily as one of the, the central figures in my chapter on uh, the dispossession of um, German Jews during the, the 1930s and, uh, 40, and, and 40s, but as a sort of um, reference to the the type of photographers um, who were able to get out and to to end up uh, elsewhere before uh, that period in question, so Xander does absolutely come up, as well as a host of of other lesser known photographers as well, photographers who were not necessarily able to continue their careers uh, later on. Uh, photographers who were uh, sadly murdered in concentration camps or death camps, uh, photographers who who had their studios stolen from them by former colleagues. So it is a, a sort of um, meditation on more well-known photographers, but also those photographers that uh, have yet to be studied and, and known in the same way. Uh, one question about strategies that that Jews used during the time of of persecution to protect themselves. Um, and I'm assuming that this question is uh, more about the broader period than um, than about the the period that I just mentioned. But during the the period of 1933 to, to 1938, um, Jewish Germans used a number of strategies to, to kind of navigate the increasingly uh, hostile and, and harsh um, climate. One was a direct protest in, in written or physical form. Um, letters published in newspapers protesting pro protesting Nazi policies and, and Nazi actions. Uh, an, a particularly vivid case of this that I, I show my students um, was the case of a Jewish German World War I veteran who was operating a business in Germany. And on the day of the April 1st blockade, uh, stood outside of his business wearing his World War I uniform and all of his uh, decorations and, and medals from the war to protest uh, the, the Nazi assault on, on Jewish businesses uh, by invoking his service to Germany during World War I uh, as a, a very um, firm basis for challenging what the Nazis were doing. So outright protests uh, was one very common response um, adapting and navigating the the policies and restrictions was also uh, another strategy used by Jewish Germans to to navigate the situation. Um, turning to the Jewish community as well, and and turning to family and friends within that community was another uh, very common response and strategy. Uh, creating. Uh, Jewish uh, community groups and religious groups and schools and, and other ways of uh, kind of coming together and creating solidarity amidst the rising persecution was uh, certainly another strategy as well. And uh, emigration was also uh, a key strategy here too. Um, if people have seen the, the recent wonderful Ken Burns documentary, The U.S. and the Holocaust, uh, that 
is a, a very affecting and, and profound portrait of the, the role of the, the U.S. in uh, emigration during this period and the sort of apathy and, and reluctance to, to really uh, increase the number of Jewish refugees that the U.S. was willing to take uh, from Europe. Um, but in general, emigration to, to nearby uh, European regions, especially France, at the time was also a, a common response as well among Jewish Germans uh, to this, this era of persecution. Um, so, yes. Uh, oh, sorry, Matt. Um, oh no, no. Go go ahead. If you have another, if you have another question, I, I wasn't sure if if you were uh, finished. Go ahead. Yeah. No. The the question on uh, fake photography or stage photography that was used as uh, propaganda and um, kind of packaged or presented as as accurate the. The example of that that comes to my mind is the photography that that many uh, Nazis produced of uh, those who who were forced to live in Jewish ghettos in Nazi occupied Europe. And the point of that photography was to depict Jews in filthy, deplorable conditions to then say in Nazi propaganda that this was how they lived rather than these were the conditions made for them to live by the Nazis. Uh, so those kinds of photographs staged and, and created to convey a particular message and a particular image about Jews uh, was very common um, during the war, uh, especially. So that particular example comes to mind um, when, when thinking about that. Matt, did you want to? Uh, I was I just wasn't sure where, where you know we're coming coming to the, the conclusion of questions and um it's amazing I say, even in the last question you answered how many parallels there are today and I was just thinking that it's it's uh or being thankful that today the Jewish community is able to to counter some of these through their you know through our own photography and media in general and so um mm -hmm. and then um just I was wondering if you just had any, any final thoughts that you wanted to to leave us with this evening. Um, well, thank you everybody for uh, your comments and your questions and and for listening. And, and I really appreciate you being here tonight. Um, I'm hoping to continue working on this subject and, and especially look for more instances uh, in which photographic denunciation was practiced during World War II beyond German borders um, and not just in, in Shanghai, China. So uh, it very much is still uh, a research work in process. Um, and you've all given me some, some additional good ideas to consider as I go forward. So thank you very much. Yes, th thank you again. And, and if you, you know, when you, when you start publishing different pieces, we're, we're happy to share them with our, with our audience. So we'll, we'll be definitely interested in hearing updates as uh, as your research unfolds so oh wonderful yeah. i should i should mention then that that um there is an article that uh came out this summer with contemporary european history that is based on this research so i'm i'm happy to send that uh to you for for people to read if people are interested yeah definitely any any articles or um books or, or, or anything that you want to pass along, well, we can send it to everyone in our follow-up email. So Wonderful. That's great. All right. Well, thank you again. And thank you all uh, out there for joining us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon, um, possibly tomorrow if, you, if you're available. So have a great rest of your day. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Good night.